uh, modem was uh, uh, actually uh, installed in the computer itself. So when you try to connect to the internet, you, you uh, to, to the to the uh, internet so called internet right uh, or we, when you try to connect to the bulletin board service you actually have to plug in the telephone cable into your uh, cpu your central processing unit right in order to access that uh, bbs or the internet later on so um uh, after that it evolves to the internet now i use the internet so uh, back then i was very curious you know with regards to programming so i started off with uh, a bit of programming about uh, turbo pascal uh programming c c plus plus programming around that right but it really that doesn't uh it intrigue me so um and at that point of time you know back in the day 20 years uh many many years ago when i was a teenager it was like 30 years ago okay and um at pasar malam they used to uh, sell these uh cds Right, this this pirated CDs and this pirated CDs consists of security tools. So I, I like to use that security tools and I like to reverse engineer that security tools and try to understand those security tools because that security tools can use for hacking. And, and I used to do a, a bit of hacking here and there. At the point of time, the laws were not as stringent as now. Now you have all the acts of all the regulations you know in the world, right, to try to uh, combat. Uh, hacking but back then you know we were just trying to test out and to see whether we're able to gain access to a website or try to kick someone off from the uh, chat room you know with all these available tools out there and uh, that's where my uh, interest start to pick right um, and uh, I uh, start to uh, when I go to uh, uh, polytechnic I took up uh, computer systems you know I, I want to learn more about uh, computer systems but particularly i want i love uh security so and uh when i went to the police force for my national service i i, I signed up with the national uh, singapore police force and uh there in the singapore police force uh there is a police technology department and the it security team right in the police technology department uh i come to know that from magazines right i read on magazines then i sign up as a regular but back then, I was lucky. I was uh, given the posting and asked them. That, uh, I told them actually that I want to join the police technology department, IT security team, and eventually got my posting. So, and I was a police officer. So, instead of serving two and a half years NS, I served five years as a regular. Uh, and in that five years as a regular, I was in the IT security uh, division right, of the police technology department. And uh that, that's where i started off right uh, my first career is in the it security uh singapore police force uh so in in it security singapore police force i do a lot of things right i do from security administration of security tools i do uh, a bit of uh hacking here and there we call it penetration testing uh incident response we investigate you no know, incidents various various incidents uh such as viruses worms one of them Right. And um, we do uh, security consulting, uh, security audit. So I learned so much uh, in IT security uh, within the Singapore Police Force. And uh, I feel that is not enough, right? Because uh, you see, my, my interest started back then. And I, I do not know that now cybersecurity is that hot. And people now venture into cybersecurity because one, they... Uh, think that they are able to uh, earn, earn a lot of money in cybersecurity right? and it's a, a hot uh, job you know, uh, right now. Uh, but I, I do not know that it's even going to balloon up you know, to, uh, a, a, as much as now right? uh, with regards to cybersecurity. So um, uh, besides getting the experience, I also wanted to earn the qualifications. And when I look around, right, there isn't much qualification, uh, uh, educational qualifications with regards to IT security back then. So I started off with, uh, I, I, but I saw this specialist diploma in Infocom security with Tomasic Poly. So I took that up. And then after that, I saw a master's of internet security management right, uh, with Curtin University. And it's through the informatics learning school uh, over here in Singapore. I'm not sure whether informatics is still around. I don't think so. Uh, and I took that. I, I was like the first batch, right, to take uh masters in internet security management. Then I feel that okay, that's not enough. Now I want to take up certifications, right? So I took up CSSP and CISA. So CSSP is the Certified Information Systems Security Professional, and CISA is a Certified Information Systems Auditor. 
Okay. And uh, why I took these certifications? Why I took this educational qualification? Because I want to compete with uh, the rest in the market. Because after five years in the uh, government sector, I want to venture into the public sector. And you can see the second job here is Ernst and Young, right? So I want to venture into the public sector. I want to make sure that I stand out. So how do I make sure that I stand out through this experience that I've gained through the educational qualifications, through the certifications, right? Then uh, back then, it's not, the competition is not as tough as now. Now, if you want to venture into cybersecurity, the competition is very, very, very tough. I can tell you that. Because you have students right, taking a diploma in uh, cybersecurity in polytechnics, majoring in cybersecurity in universities, going for internship and landing themselves in IT security departments, divisions, right, in various companies from startups, MNCs to banks. So now, the question that you have to ask yourself, if you want to venture into uh, IT security or if cyber security, right, what makes you stand out from the person next to you who also wants to do the same thing? Right, so you have to ask yourself that. Then I realize that, okay, when I uh, put out my resume, right, uh, out there, then I realize that uh, I don't get any traction. So what do I have to do? I have to go and network. So that now, Back then, there's not much associations, right? But now there's a lot of associations. Like, for example, we have the uh, AISP, uh, IC Squared, uh, ISACA, that, so on and so forth. So back then, it was ISACA, Information Systems Audit and Control Association uh, for the Singapore chapter, right? It is a big organization in the US and globally now, right? But uh, back then, there's one in Singapore chapter, which I attended. I, I network with fellow professionals out there. I was very young in the industry. I was just a few years in the industry, right? And I was very young back then. Uh, so I don't have much experience. But the people who attend the ISACA uh, events, right, are people who are senior in the industry. They are senior managers, managers, uh, even partners in uh, big four accounting firms. right? So... What I do is that I went there and I network with them, right? So I network with them and get to know them and tell, telling them about myself, right? And try not to be, you don't be shy, right? Just go out there and network. So when I uh, network, right? Then I know that, oh, they're actually looking for people. And this is where I tell them that, hey, uh, I'm actually venturing out to the private sector. So I was hoping that, you know, if there are any interviews that uh, I can uh, uh, venture into, you know, uh, you know, appreciate if you can uh, let me know. Right, so, and uh, I, I'm also uh, quite ambitious. You know, when I was young, no, very, very ambitious. Right? So, I, what I do, uh, what I did uh, is that I plan my careers ahead. Right? So, when I was in the IT uh, security with the Singapore Police Force, I already planned uh, three careers ahead. Like I put uh, on a piece of paper that you know, I want to uh, be uh, an auditor in a big four uh, accounting firm. Right? And then the next one is I want to become a... A uh, senior auditor, or no, no, uh, a manager, audit manager uh, in an investment bank. And third, I want to uh, become an expatriate uh, in an uh, oil, I guess, uh, oil and gas industry in uh, Middle East. Right? So I put that down. Right? So when I put those careers down uh, on paper, then I uh, also figure out how am I going to achieve that career? Right? That particular role, how am I going to achieve? And uh, is it through educational qualification? Is it through networking with people? And back then, LinkedIn was there. So I networked with, on LinkedIn also, right? And LinkedIn is now very popular. Everyone, everyone should go on LinkedIn. And uh, with, with that, right, I was able to land myself a job in uh, as an auditor in uh, Ernst and Young. I left as a senior auditor. I came into, then after that, I went to Barclays Bank as an audit manager at investment bank. Right? Ernst and Young is a big four accounting firm. And then uh, after that, I uh, got an expatriate role as a senior auditor and senior investigator in uh, Qatar Petroleum, based in Qatar, right? Uh, is in the Middle East. So, uh, you know, you you basically uh, have to plan uh, your careers and know how you're able to achieve those uh, roles that you are interested in, especially in cybersecurity. You have to be very specific, right? If you're not uh, 
specific, right? That is very difficult for you to know what you are supposed to do in order to achieve that role. Especially in this climate, uh, a lot of people who wants to venture into cybersecurity, but uh, it's actually a very, very uh, tough market uh, and uh, recruiters, uh, uh, hiring managers like me, no, we are looking for talents out there. So we are looking for people who are who have the cybersecurity talents, right? Not any Tom, Dick, and Harry can come in into cybersecurity without any uh, experience, unless the company is looking for uh, someone fresh out of uh, school, okay, or a mid-career move, right? It's a possibility. Okay, then um, after I come back from Qatar, uh, I uh, joined uh, KPMG. I know a partner there from ISACA, again, now which I have network uh, back in 2006, right? I know the partner in 2006. You know, I, I served on the board of directors together with him, right? Uh, in 2006. But when I came back to Singapore in 2015, uh, yeah, 2016 rather, in 2016, right? I met up with the partner, that, keep, uh, that, that guy who served together with me on the board of directors. And uh, he was already senior back then, right? He was... Like when I was just an engineer with the police force, he was a vice president in the bank, in the offshore bank. So he gave me a job, right, in KPMG. And after KPMG, in KPMG, I was also the deputy CISO. The CISO is a chief information security officer. Basically, you run the cybersecurity function. And then after that, I went to the NTUC Enterprise as the group CISO. Then I built up. Uh, the cybersecurity function in a consulting company called PrivateSec, uh, which is a boutique firm based in uh, Australia. And um, then now, currently, I'm in uh, Circus Life. So uh, I, I'm also an adjunct lecturer uh, with, in cybersecurity with a couple of universities, including uh, Adventists. Right? And uh, I am also on the board of directors for the Association of uh, Muslim uh, Professionals. So you basically, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that in the cybersecurity journey, uh, which I have started, I've started very long time ago, right? Since I was a teenager because of the interest that I have. So if you're in cybersecurity, you need to have that passion, that interest, right? I, I uh, yeah, the, the, the interest is, the, the, the fire is still there. So I'm still interested. That's why I, from uh, practicing, which I'm still practicing right, in Circus Life, right? I am also giving back my knowledge uh, with regards to cybersecurity to uh, the masses out there, right? Whether they are students or whether they are mid-career professionals uh, or whether even my peers, right? And uh, in uh, cybersecurity, it's, it's important for us to also attend seminars, seminars, conferences like this, right? This kind of seminars to basically understand uh, someone's journey if you're interested to uh, venture into cybersecurity and feel free to ask me questions you know, at the end of this uh, presentation and uh, also to know more what cybersecurity is all about. Okay, all right. So this is basically my journey. And now let me go through with regards to some of the slides related to cybersecurity. I do not want to go uh, in depth because I also want to, uh, we only have until 8.30, so I want to make sure that I have time for uh, any, every, any one of you who would like to ask questions now with regards to uh, the cyber, the world of cybersecurity, so to speak. Okay, so this is what I mentioned just now, right? When I started off in, in uh, cyber, cybersecurity, it was not called cybersecurity. It was called data security, then it evolves to IT security, information security, and now cybersecurity. Why? Because data security back then, right, people are concerned uh, with regards to data that is stored in the mainframes, right? They use mainframes back then, right? Uh, IBM mainframes is one of them. So they call it data security. Oh yeah, we need to secure this data in the mainframes. Okay, uh, data security. Then after that is IT security. IT security, why well, now they start to have a uh, network, right? Uh, they start to have uh, uh, servers, uh, hubs here, switches there, right? And then they want to uh, protect their uh, perimeter, right, um, of the infrastructure. So they call it, oh, IT security, information technology security. Okay, fine. Then after that, it evolves to information security. Why, oh, data is a form of information, right? So we have a lot of information lying around here and there, right? So we need to also protect this information. So everything, you know, with regards to information in the servers, information in the uh, 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 
uh, routers, uh, information in the security uh, devices, so on and so forth, information security. Okay. Then after that, it evolves to cyber security. Oh, there's a lot of hackers out there, not external now. There's a lot of internet, uh, hackers in the internet, you know, and uh, all of us are accessing the internet, right? So we want to protect the hackers from coming in. Oh, this is a cyber world, right? So that is called cyber security. Actually, one of my uh, friends you know, uh, who come up with the term uh, cyber security in, uh, in the government sector over here in Singapore. So he's he he's the one that right where I ask him. So is the cybersecurity uh combined or is cybersecurity uh one word or two words? Now you see actually cybersecurity is one word, but people now play with two words, right? So which one? No, is it one word or is two words? Now you say uh you know anything else you can do, right? So cybersecurity, one word, two words, up to you lah. Okay, whatever you want to do. So cybersecurity, uh basically, like right, if you think about it, uh it is just like insurance okay uh it is playing in the game of fear so when you are sick you know you 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 have your health insurance right so your health insurance will be able to take care of you when you go to a hospital or when you have a serious illness right and uh if you get into touch wood if you get into an accident right your car insurance is there to to protect you right? so cyber security is like a to protect uh, the organization from the external threats, right? Because these external threats may cause harm to the organization. We'll come to that later. Okay, so uh, this is a traditional IT security. If you talk about uh, IT security, we talk about CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It's very straightforward, right? Confidentiality is with regards to uh, securing, uh, protecting the uh, information, the confidential information, such as your customer information, such as your passwords, uh, such as your uh, bank details, right? So you need to store this in confidence. So you do not want it to be exposed to a, a third party, okay? And the next one is um, uh, integrity. Okay, CIA, okay? It's not Central Intelligence Agency, but confidential integrity availability. So integrity, you want to make sure that the information that is inside your servers, for example, or your computers, if you have transactions, right? You do not want people to tamper with your transactions. People to, you do not want hackers to tamper with your financial data. So you want to keep them intact, right? So what goes in, okay, goes out the same thing, right? It's processed and goes out the same thing. It's not tampered halfway through. Then availability. So availability is to make sure that the information that you have or the access that you have is constantly available. Like for example, if you think about it in your office, right? So in your office, uh, you have a network in your office. Right? What happens if the Wi-Fi is down? If the Wi-Fi is down, you're not able to access anything in the office. Right? You're not able to access your applications, your intranet applications or your internet. Right? You're not able to access that. So there is a denial of service in that sense. So, so because you're not able to uh, access the service that have been provided for you, okay? So traditional IT security, uh, and this is still, uh, uh, what is it called, relevant in this day and age is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, this is cyber security. So when we talk about cyber security, we talk about malware, uh, backdoor, uh, dark web, right? Uh, black hat, white hat, gray hat, right? So a lot of jargons, you know, a lot of terminology making cyber security complicated, right? But cyber security is actually very simple. It is basically to secure your organization from a cyber attack, okay? To secure your organization from a cyber attack, which may lead to data breaches, bringing financial, operational, and reputational loss to your organization. Because data breaches will lead to a loss to your organization. Financial, it will cost money. Operational, it will cost man hours, downtime. Reputational, people do people want to trust your organization? Right? Because there is a cyber attack that happened. Do people want to trust that? Uh, this is a question, right? So your reputation is at risk. So let's say that you have uh, existing customers right, in your organization. And 
your existing customers are actually using the services that you provide. But one day you are hit with a cyber attack. Then the customer decide to leave. They say, I don't trust you anymore. I'm going to leave. I'm going to bring this business somewhere else to your competition, uh, competitor. Then what happened here? You will lose money, right? You lose your reputation, but reputational loss will lead to losing money at the end of the day. Okay. Now, we can explain the concept of cybersecurity or the racing car or bike. Okay. So, uh, I'm sure many of us uh, love to watch F1. Uh, or for me, you know, I love uh, MotoGP rather than uh, F1. And, you know, uh, basically, let's take a look at the racing car. Who is in the driver's seat? Okay, for your organization. I'm sure most of you here uh, work in an organization, right? So, who is in the racing car? The CEO is the, in your racing car, right? The founders are in the racing car. And what about the other parts of the uh, car? Like, for example, the engine, the carburetors, right? Uh, the pistons, right? So, the carburetors, the pistons, the engines, right? Uh, these are basically all uh, the uh, functions in your organization. So it can be your finance function, it can be your HR function, it can be your uh, administrative function, right? And how about uh, cybersecurity? So cybersecurity is basically your tires, your steering wheel, and your brakes. Why? Because the tires, right, to uh, ensure that the CEO is able to maneuver across the obstacles, right? The, the navigate around the bends. Uh, to, to the tires are help, helping uh, him or her, right, to navigate around the bends, no, without skidding. Okay? So, strong tires, steering wheel to be able to navigate left, right, right? Uh, without the steering wheel, he will not be able to negotiate that uh, steep bends, right? Uh, then the brakes, right, to make sure that they're able to brake in time when there's obstacle. When there's another car right in front, or when there is a wall right in front, they're able to break in time. So these are cyber security, uh, basically for the car. Okay. The evolving threat landscape started way back. Okay, in two thousand two, and from two thousand fourteen, the type of uh threats, cyber threats, uh persist. Okay, so it started off with like uh. uh viruses, worms, right? It may be harmful, right? We have the blaster worm back then. We have the I love you virus, right? Uh, we have the Nimda virus uh, back then, right? And we have script kiddies, hobby hackers. These are basically script kiddies. So script kiddies uh, who want to test out, right? Who want to uh, hack uh, an organization and see whether they're able uh, to do it or not, whether they're successful. Then it evolves to spam to phishing to e-commerce uh hijacking mobile threats right uh trojans and now uh to state sponsored attacks uh organized crime cyber warfare right advanced persistent threats right by uh state sponsored uh hackers state sponsored hackers are hackers that are, are sponsored by uh certain countries okay uh who want to attack another country Right, so the threat landscape is evolving and it is continual, uh, continually evolving uh, until now. Now, what is the uh, top of the town? Phishing, right? I'm sure you, you guys saw the OCBC uh, scams that's happening. People are receiving OCBC scams, IRA scams, DBS scams, uh, and uh, the uh, calls from the... Uh, pretending to be from a Singapore police force, right? So I'll explain to that uh, in, in a little while, okay? Right, so security breaches are expensive uh, from the various companies. As you can see that the financial impact of an information security breach can come in the form of uh, a lot of things, like for example, like legal fees, like reputational damage, right? Uh, loss of business, like I mentioned just now, right? And uh, the costs are also uh, include many factors right? like for example the type and amount of data affected and what the cyber criminal does know with the uh, data or the system you know, so on and so forth right so 
um, the this is a global study of a current cost of a data breach, right? So the average cost of a data breach is three point eight six million, right? And uh, per loss or stolen record is hundred and forty eight dollars. But if you have an incident response team, right, the cost savings that you can get, right, from this is fourteen dollars per record. Okay, it's actually reduced from hundred and forty eight to fourteen dollars. Now, this is Bruce Schneier, is one of the security guru uh, since way back in the day, right? So he mentioned here there's only amateur attack machines, professional target people. Why? People is actually the weakest link, right? And all of us know that people is actually the weakest link. It just requires one person in the organization to click on that phishing link to bring down the entire organization. Because why? That one phishing link can be a uh, attack vector or can be uh, the start of a ransomware attack right, to the entire organization. And you know what happened in the ransomware attack, right? So all of your files are basically encrypted. You're not able to access those files, right? And uh, potentially, right, all these uh, computers or PCs, right, or laptops, right, they have to be thrown away already. You cannot use them. Right, you have to bring a, a fresh a new one in and hopefully you have backups. If you do not have backups, there goes the data in your entire organization. Even though you pay the uh, attackers, right, uh, there is no guarantee that they will be able to decrypt, uh, they will decrypt uh, the files for you. And even if they decrypt the files for you now, that doesn't mean that they won't encrypt the files again later. Right, so once you have given the key, right, they will always have access to your house. Okay, so cybersecurity challenges, right, has become very important uh, from uh, the external threats that's happening day in, day out. And right? we talked about that earlier. Okay, the change in the way that business is conducted because nowadays the, it's all online, all digital, right? So we cannot live without the internet. So cloud computing, the social media, uh, and the companies are allowing, uh, bring your own devices to work. And now with the work from home, uh, uh, work from home mindset, right, that we have right now, the culture that we have right now, how are you actually protecting, right, your, the network in your house? How are you protecting the Wi-Fi in your house, right? Then the rapid technology change, everything is becoming smart now. We're going to towards the Internet of Things, you know, we have, we've, which have been around for quite a number of years. You know, regulatory compliance, data, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, organizations now are required and mandated you know, by the Cybersecurity Act, by the Personal Data Protection Act, by GDPR, you know, so on and so forth. And uh, the challenging market and client needs um, the, uh, uh, the the cyber response you know, uh, in the market uh, it is actually becoming more and more intense you know, right now. Okay, cyber attackers. Though these are some of the cyber attackers, right? Um, insiders, uh, script kiddies, uh, cyber criminals, hacktivists, state actors, right? So insiders are insider attacks, right? Those who are working in your uh, organization and it's actually the one which is most dangerous. Okay, because it's sometimes very difficult to detect them. Then we have script kiddies, those who want to test out, right? We have uh, uh, cyber criminals who is out there to uh, uh, gain uh, or have a financial interest, now state actors and hacktivists. Okay, cyber attackers, uh, there's a lot of ways that uh, cyber att attackers can work, right? Uh, through phishing, spear phishing, smishing, and wishing, right? If you guys want to know, I will talk about it later on. But if you guys want to know that uh, the technique that is being used by the with the OCBC scam is actually a form of smishing. Smishing is actually phishing via SMS, okay? And that's why they receive uh, SMS, right? And when they click the link on the SMS, and then it will bring them to a particular website whereby they have to fill in the confidential information. So uh, there's also malware. Malware is a form of malicious software. And when you click on a phishing link, for example, right, 
uh, you can download a, a key logger, right? A key logger allows the attacker or the hacker, right, to know what are the keys that you type you know, on your laptop, right? If, for example, you type uh, ABC, they will be able to see from their computer ABC. Ransomware, I spoke to you about it, is actually a form of malicious software that is able to encrypt the files in your organization. And the way that you're able to decrypt it is to pay a ransom, right, to the attackers or to the hackers. But uh, typically, um, they will be able to allow you to do it once, right, to, to decrypt the file for you, but there's no guarantee that they will encrypt it again. So have to be very careful. So my uh, normally my suggestion to uh, people when they are affected with ransomware, just throw away the notebook. Make sure you uh, have a new notebook and uh, you back up your data in those notebook. Okay, then denial service uh, attacks are basically to deny that service that you uh, have been given, right? Uh, like I've mentioned about your network, right? If someone launched a denial or service attack on your network, you're not able to uh, access the internet, access your internet, then that is a form of DOS, okay? Or denial of service. Then man in the middle attack is whereby the uh, attackers is able to sniff uh, the traffic, the network traffic, right? Between you and maybe your customer, right? And to be able to get those confidential information from uh, that uh, channel itself, right? So the way that you are able to protect the main in the middle attack is via encryption, for example. Then exploitation of vulnerabilities. There's a lot of vulnerabilities out there. Like, uh, for example, your web application or your mobile application can be vulnerable. And uh, because, why are they vulnerable? Because they are not patched. So if they are not patched, right? Uh, allows attackers to exploit those vulnerabilities and maybe uh, extract the confidential data that is present in uh, those applications, okay? Yep, just to give you an idea, if you just look at cyber attacks uh, on uh, Google, there's uh, huge results that um, you'll be able to receive. Okay, companies that contain a breach, uh, a breach in less than 30 days can save over a million dollars, right? Okay, all right. So threat and exposure on the rise. Okay, let's go through here. Okay, so the industrial age of hacking. So more hackers, no plus, and there's more money out there will lead to organized hacking and scams. No, like, uh, it is actually a very profitable industry for the hackers. Okay, to be selling and buying information, uh, secrets and access, no, on the dark web. No, they, they're able to get all this confidential information, for example, the data, right? And then they sell it on the dark web and they're able to earn a lot of money from there. Okay, cloud pets. Also be, uh, be careful, like, for example, these are cloud pets, uh, Internet of Things, right? Uh, Internet of Things, uh, and these are, uh, uh, it may look cute, right? It may look cuddly, you know, for the kids. But uh, do uh, bear in mind that uh, these uh, kind of, uh, uh, Internet of Things that are connected, these are connected toys, you know, for, uh, it's actually to keep an eye on the kids, right, uh, uh, who have babysitters, for, or, or the babysitters, for example, right, but these were actually pulled off the shelf in uh, December 2017 because they have vulnerabilities in the toy itself, which allow uh, strangers to see and hear and talk to the children via these toys. So you see how Dangerous it can be when there are vulnerabilities. And this is because of a vulnerabilities in these toys. Okay, uh, I'm sure if you have kids, you no, know, like me, the young kids, right? Uh, they like to watch uh, Ryan's Toy Review or, or Casey and Rachel. And uh, you can see that it's amazing, right? For example, like Ryan's Toy Review, these are the data that I pulled out uh, quite some time back. So it's 60 million uh, subscribers. Casey and Rachel have about almost a million subscribers here. And uh, guess what? Because now young kids, right, they are shopping online, right? Um, they, they, they don't, uh, like, like me back in the day, you know, if I want something, I go to the shop and I look at it, oh, I'm interested, then I'll buy it, right? Uh, that's probably I have money. But now uh, the kids, when they do their shopping, right, they don't go to shops and shop, right? They actually go to YouTube, right? And uh, go through Ryan's toy review and say, oh, man, I like this toy. So then they ask, oh, daddy, can I buy this toy? Right. Uh, when they go to Toy R Us, when we bring them to Toy R Us, they just straight away pick up this toy. Then we ask them, how do you know about this toy? Oh, I watched Ryan's toy review. Right. 
And now, now these kids have uh, uh, email addresses, uh, Apple IDs, uh, and uh, Facebook, Instagram, and even TikTok, right? So we have to be uh, extra careful because the world is actually changing now, okay? And it's going really, really digital. Right? Everything is online. Kids cannot live without smartphones. And adults, no, we cannot live without smartphones, okay? So, uh, fishing is the number one attack vector. Um, at, uh, it has grown up to 40.9% 40, 40 uh, in uh, recent years. Right? And 90, but 98% of the attacks contain no malware. Right? But 98% of the attacks contain, contain no malware, but they, when you click on the link, it will bring you to a phishing site whereby you enter the confidential information, like, like the uh, OCBC scam. Okay, so... Uh, if you see here, there's many, many types of attack, right? Um, but the top three most common attacks here will be business email compromise or email account compromise, confidence, fraud romance, and non-payment or non-delivery uh, of items, okay? All right, so let, let me talk uh, a little bit about phishing. So I'm sure there are some people uh, out there who have been involved uh, in uh, fishing, who have fished before, or this is a way for you to protect yourself not to be fish. Yeah. Um. So there's a lot of uh, news out there. Now let me just uh, skip this. Okay, this is the latest uh, news. Uh, at least 8.5 million loss uh, in uh, December to fishing scams uh, involving uh, OCBC Bank. Uh, as you can see here, right. The transaction function of your OCBC account will be suspended to prevent your account from being locked out. Update it on December 26. Fantastic, right? If uh, but access bit.ly, right? There's bit.ly link uh, over here, and you know that hey, eh, you know how come it's bit.ly? It's quite funny for OCBC Bank to give that kind of link, right? Okay, this is a phishing scam by Singapore Airlines. Uh, and this phishing scam by Singapore Airlines, uh, it, it, as you can see, right, um, is really ridiculous. And this is the Singapore Airlines uh, site, uh, a phishing site not for Singapore Airlines. And as you can see here, the language, you see this language is actually by Google, right? The uh, language translator, right? And, uh, and people are actually clicking on this, right? And a lot of people have been duped by this uh, phishing uh, scam itself. Okay, so I will not go through these uh, facts. Okay, phishing, right? So phishing is uh, disguising as a trustworthy entity, okay, in a digital format to obtain actually sensitive information. So uh, it is actually a type of scam. You must know that. And uh, uh, phishers, right? They use social engineering techniques, right, to deceive the users and to acquire confidential information such as uh, username, passwords, credit card numbers, etc. And phishing emails yeah, may entice you to click on a link or attachment which may allow, uh, allow malicious software to be installed on your machine. This is called drive-by download. Like I mentioned to you, right, a keylogger. A keylogger can be a, a form of malicious software that is installed in your machine. And if you click on it, right, it allows the hackers to look at what you are doing. Okay, it even can turn on your video camera by it. They can even turn on your video camera. Okay. I turn on your microphone, right? Spear phishing is more targeted. So spear phishing is like phishing, but they are more targeted to a specific individuals or positions of authority. Like for example, um, uh, for uh, example, like CEOs, uh, CFOs, uh, or PA to CFO, PA to CEO, right? Sometimes uh, you, uh, uh, you, you try to, uh, the hackers try to, uh, spoof themselves, right, as uh, the CEO, and then send an email to the PA, asking the PA to do things, right? And this happened in my organization, whereby uh, uh, the uh, hacker tried to uh, send a phishing email to my uh, organization, to the uh, individuals in my organization, and uh, claiming to be from to be from my uh, founder, right, and uh, ask them to buy uh, an Apple card, right, or some card, right? So luckily, uh, because we have gone through a lot of security awareness training in the organization, you know, they, they have not fallen uh, victims right, to those kind of spear phishing scams. Okay, next is vishing. Okay, 
Bixing actually use social engineering over telephone system to get access to personal and financial information. A type of vishing is actually uh, the scam calls uh, uh, of the uh, individual who uh, pretend to be from the Singapore police force, right? Either he was wearing a mask and he was wearing the police force uh, uniform with the cap and all that, right? So there can also be a type of vishing. And uh, hackers uh, will also use the social engineering uh, via vishing technique right, to basically uh, call your internet service provider right, to get information uh, about you, all right, or even uh, try to uh, purchase a new line right, under your name. Right? So there's a lot of uh, ways uh, and techniques that uh, hackers can do out there with regards to phishing. Then uh, next one is phishing. So phishing is, like I've mentioned, phishing in the form of SMS. So attackers can send text messages, no claiming from reputable companies like OCBC, DBS, right? And what they do, they induce you, right, to click on the phishing links. And the phishing link will bring them to a fraudulent site. And the fraudulent site, trust me, right, they really look like the original site, right? You can even A, right, that's, uh, you can change the A to, to another type of A. You can even change I to one, right? And you will not be able to notice it. Right, so if uh, I want to uh, do OCBC.com, uh, right, the uh, I can if uh, I, I can always do OCBC, uh, I can change the O right to zero, right, and you will not be able to notice, right. So, um, and the uh, phishing links can may also contain malware, right, but this is the most harmful because if the phishing links contain malware, right, this can be downloaded to your phone and allow the attackers to gain control of your phone. Okay, this is a type of uh, sample of phishing attack also. Okay, as uh, you can see here. Uh, and um, I, I ran a phishing exercise before, right, in my organization, right? Um, some of the, uh, uh, what, what I try to do here is that I try to entice them and to click on this particular link. Click here to reset your account. So I told them that hey, your Windows account has expired, immediate action is required. So uh, dear colleague, in the recent critical upgrade of our IT systems, we were required to expire all Windows account. So as such, you immediately required to reset your Windows account to continue assessing your resources. So they click on this Windows account. Then what happened next? 4,480 users in the organization, 1,078 click on the phishing link, and 1,008 provided your credentials, user ID, current password, and new password. In the five, first five minutes of my exercise, 400 plus users click on the phishing link and 300 plus users provided their credentials. I don't need days. No, I just need five minutes. Then I, can, I can get so many users. But imagine that the hacker doesn't need 400, 300 users. The hacker need only one user to get access to your organization, okay? Right, but if you can see, right, there's a lot of phishing indicators, I call it phishing indicators, to basically tell us, right, uh, that this is actually a phishing email, right? So when I put here, whenever they show an email that uh, says uh, your, your Windows account expired or something that asks you to click on something immediately, stop, question yourself first, right? Do not straight away click, right? You question yourself. Then after that, you, you, you see, does it does the email make sense or not? You're immediately required to reset your Windows account, but you're already in Windows. So how come you're immediately required to reset your Windows account? Does it make sense, right? Then click here to reset your account. Hover, hover over the link. Right? This is a link here, a URL, right? You hover over the link, and then you look at the link. It's an account reset, uh, account underscore reset, redeem ID, and all these juggles. Does it make sense? So if this doesn't make sense, what do you do? Give a call. Give a call to give a call to uh, your IT department and ask them, hey, you know, uh, is this email valid or not? Okay. Right. So a lot of ways to identify the phishing attack, the spelling, their spelling and grammatical errors, right? But hackers are becoming more smarter, so it's less of that. Uh, emails can be threatening, right? Uh, like I've mentioned, they are trying to induce you, right? Give you undue pressure. 
look at the URL links, you know, make sure scroll over it, right? At unknown source, if the email from unknown source and unrelated to business, that the probability of it being a scam is high. So question yourself first before you click on any links. Okay, there's a lot of impact of phishing attacks. Trust, reputation, branding of the organization will be affected. Um, data breach, right, can lead to a data breach, can lead to financial losses and um, the theft of uh, identity and confidential details, oh, for sure. So why phishing is still a problem? Because everyone have the mindset that IT department is keeping us safe. InfoSec is keeping us safe, right? We should, security is everyone's responsibility. Everyone must know that. Then we have the click first mentality. We want to make sure that we click on the, we want to uh, respond to every email as fast as possible, right? We want to clear all our emails. Then trust rather than verify. We trust people. We have to verify, right? Once we verify them, then we know, okay, whether the email is legit or not. Then the concept of it won't happen to me. Right? There are people think like that. Oh, this won't happen to me, right? I won't lose money due to phishing. But look at what happened right now. So many people lose money due to phishing, right? And hackers are becoming more smarter. They now have personalized phishing targeted solely for you. Okay? So with regards to uh, phishing or as the scams that's happening right now, uh, is going on, right? First of all, you thing, do not click on links in your SMS, right? So if the SMS claim that your bank or any other account have been suspended, call your customer service officer first, right? You must understand, right? Hey, why your account has been suspended? If you do not know that your account, if you do not have any reason to believe that your account has been suspended, then why will you trust that particular SMS? Give a call to your customer service officer, right? If you receive an email in your uh, corporate email, asking you to click on a link saying that your account has been suspended or disabled, right? Give a call to your IT department. I disable, do I disable uh, uh, people's account in my organization. But before I disable their account, I give them three warnings, right? This is the reason because they don't attend the security awareness training, I give them three warnings. After three warnings, right, I'm going to disable your account even without you telling me. Uh. So next one, similar with emails. Do not click on links or any attachment from senders that you do not rec recognize. If you do not know the person, right, why would you want to leak, uh, uh, click on the uh, links or the attachment? And especially be wary of .zip or executable file because they can contain viruses okay, or malware. Then do not provide sensitive personal information like passwords over email or phone. There's no reason for you to provide your passwords Right, your uh, bank account details so to people over the phone, right, or, or over email. Then inspect the URL links, right, hover the URL links, take a look to see whether they are legitimate or not. And try to ens ensure that you install an antivirus, right, on your mobile phones and your uh, laptops. 